this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it.
of Suma and its polytheistic religion expanded towards the northwest into Babylonia, then even further west. It went to what we now know as Canaan and Phoenicia. More about this group later. Call Ukraine and southern Russia, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. There they took on the name Khazars and called their new homeland the Kingdom of Khazaria after their ancestors. Joseph Khagan, King of the Khazars, explained in a letter to the Foreign Secretary of the Caliph of Cordoba, Hasdai ibn Chaprut, that his people were direct descendants from Japheth, son of Noah. Khazaria was right at the center of the northwestern Silk Road. Merchants who traveled through Khazaria had to pay toll, a lucrative way to swell the coffers of the kingdom. The Khazars were different than the peoples from the surrounding countries. They were described as thieves and spies. They were said to be lawless people who lived a life of sin, of sexual extremities and of cruelty. They would murder travelers from other countries and adopt their identity. They were masters of deceit. And last but not least, they were said to worship Baal, also referred to as Moloch, a representation of Lucifer that demanded child sacrifice. In return, Baal was said to reward them with riches, with fame and fortune. The neighboring countries despised them. They hated their sacrificial rituals in which they threw babies into the flames or cut them open to drink their blood and eat their flesh, claiming it gave them incredible power and energy and eternal youth. Urged by these surrounding peoples, the Russian ruler knew he had to do something. In the year 600, he warned their king, Bulan, that their Luciferian practices had to end. He told him they had to convert to either Judaism, Christianity or Islam. The choice was his. Bulan chose Judaism. But he did not really convert. He merely took elements from Judaism and forged them into his own Luciferian belief. King Bulan and his people lived on and prospered. Nothing much had changed, except for the fact that for outsiders, they now called themselves Judeans, which they were not. Mind you, the name Jew wasn't invented until the 18th century. Four centuries went by. In 965 AD, the Russian ruler, Grand Prince of Kiev, Sviatoslav I, felt they had gone too far with their continued devil worshipping and child sacrifice. He decided to out. But the Khazars had their spies everywhere, and the Russian cunning plan was brought to the ears of the Khazarian king who, just in time, fled the country with his 25 wives and 60 concubines, all of the nobility, plus an enormous amount of gold and silver. The entire exodus of royalty and nobility went via Hungary to Poland, then from Germany southward to France and Spain. Everywhere they went, some were left behind. In order to reveal their true identity, they called themselves Ashkenazi Judeans, knowing very well that their new home countries would not exactly be eagerly awaiting Luciferian Khazars. Ashkenaz, by the way, the name of a region inhibited through their migration from Sumer to Babylonia to the Caucasus. Like all regions at that time, this one too was called after the descendants of Noah. Ashkenaz being a grandson of Japheth and great-grandson of Noah. Now don't worry, you don't have to remember any of this. We just need to tell you from a historical point of view. It 
does explain a lot, though, as Japheth, son of Noah, had two Askenaz and Togarma, who became arch enemies according to rabbinic literature. Now, the people we are dealing with here descended from Togarma, yet they adopted the name of their arch enemy, Askenaz. Why? We will soon find out. Just remember this it was all by design. The Askenazim settled in their new homelands and swore to rebuild their empire. In no time, they built up an empire of wealth and influence. After all, they were the royalty and nobility of the ancient bloodlines of Sumer and Babylonia. They had the startup capital, so to speak. They swore to take revenge on Russia, the country they had been expelled from. Their revenge also stretched out to the Jews, as in the original people from Judea. Why? Because back in the time of Princess Jezebel, during a situation in which two deities were challenged, they chose Yahweh over Baal. That was their death sentence, as the Khazarian Ashkenazim would never forget, nor forgive. Within a few years after they had settled in Europe, they formed an absolute master plan. A plan so big, so intelligent, and so evil, it would change the fate of the world forever. One of the Khazarian families that had joined the exodus from Khazaria was the Rothschild family. That's right, the Rothschilds I talked about in part two of my previous series. They settled in Frankfurt, Germany, where they became wealthy and powerful through trade and banking. They called southern Germany Askenaz, as a tribute to their ancestry. They offered notes to travelers who left behind their gold and silver, safely stored in the vaults of the Rothschilds, banknotes against deposits. This way, they collect an unprecedented amount of riches, combined with the interest they received, were further used to extend their wealth, and thus, their power. Maya Amshul Rothschild had five sons who became powerful bankers in five large cities. Frankfurt, London, Paris, Vienna, and Naples. In no time, they gained financial power over all of Europe. They became the personal bankers of kings and queens. They even became the treasurers of the Vatican. Before we continue with an event in the 18th century that has been deliberately erased from our history books, we have to pause this storyline and go back to the early Middle Ages for a second storyline. The two will meet during this 18th century event. And when they do, things will fall into place, I promise. We'll start in the age of the Crusades. In 1048 AD, an organization was founded that we refer to as the Order of Malta. They were founded in Jerusalem. Their goal was dual. One arm of the order ran a hospital in the Holy Land to tend to Christian pilgrims. The other arm was military, tasked by Rome to protect Christians against the local Muslim population. Their symbol? The equal-armed Maltese Cross. During the first 50 years of their existence, Jerusalem was Muslim territory. The amount of Christian pilgrims who went to Jerusalem was limited, even by Islamic law. In 1096 AD, the first of nine wars broke out. It became known as the First Crusade. The Crusades were religious wars initiated and supported by the Roman Catholic Church. Their goal was to recover the Holy Land from Islamic rule. Three years after the Crusaders had left for the Holy Land, this goal was achieved. Godfrey de Bouillon and his brother Baldwin, leaders of the First Crusade, became rulers of Jerusalem. 
The Crusades may have been romanticized in literature and movies, but the truth is they were insane religious wars focused on nothing but death, destruction and forced conversion. An estimate of nearly two million people died. In 1118, a French knight by the name of Hugh de Payon founded a military order together with eight relatives and friends. They called the order the Poor Knights of the Temple of King Solomon, later known as the Knights Templar. This order sprang forth from a secret society called the Priore de Sion, the Priory of Sion, an order that, by the way, is still alive and active today. With support of the Jerusalem, Knights Templar set up altars on the Sacred Temple Mount. Their official goal was to protect pilgrims on the way from Europe to Jerusalem. In and of itself, this is fascinating. Nine knights were officially appointed to protect Christian pilgrims over a distance of four to five thousand kilometers. God only knows how they did it. Their not-so-official goal was to rebuild the Temple of Solomon that had been destroyed in 586 BC by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Why this was so important to them, we will show later on. In 1129, the Order of the Knights Templar received the official support of the Roman Catholic Church. The order grew abundantly, and donations came pouring in from all over Europe. The knights adopted a code of conduct in which they swore unfailing obedience to the master. According to researchers, the principle of obedience made the Knights Templar lethal. They acted swiftly and with certainty to do as they had been commanded. A force of Templars became an extension of the will of its commander, the Grand Master. At the height of their power, the Order of the Knights Templar comprised of almost 20,000 members. Only 10% were armed knights. The other 90% took care of infrastructure and logistics. Even though the knights had sworn to a life of poverty, the order was excessively rich, owning large plots of lands, farms, vineyards, mills, horses, arms, equipment, the island of Cyprus, and an impressive fleet of ships. All the way from Europe to Jerusalem, in every city, they had monasteries, castles, churches, universities. They were so powerful, they did not need to obey local laws. They could pass freely across all borders. They didn't have to pay taxes, and they were exempt from all authority except that of the Pope. Furthermore, everything they took from the Muslim population that they subjugated and murdered on their way was given to the order. Did they have these privileges in writing? Oh yes, Pope II took care of everything by signing the papal bull Omne Datum Optimum in 1139. All the order had to do was swear obedience and allegiance to the Pope. There was one area though in which the Templars truly excelled, banking. They had a network of banks in many countries that enabled pilgrims to deposit assets in their home countries and withdraw funds in the Holy Land. By the 13th century, the Templars had become such competent and trusted bankers that European kings and nobles who embarked on crusades to the Holy Land often forwarded large cash sums to the Templars that could be withdrawn later so they could pay their armies. The Templars even gave out loans to rulers. They accepted everything they did, for which they were overloaded with donations, gifts, fame and fortune. However, in the early 14th century, the Knights Templar met their final destiny. 
King Philip IV of France. This man was heavily indebted by the order. When he asked for even more loans, the order refused. King Philip decided it was time for the Knights Templar to meet their maker. On Friday the 13th of October 1307, a multitude of knights were arrested, including their Grand Master, Jacques de Molay. After years of imprisonment, he and Melz were burned at the stake. Medieval documents state that Malay called out a curse over the king and the pope, Clement V, who had failed to protect them against the wrath of the king and who had even dissolved the order through his papal bull, Fox in Excelsum. Although the pope dissolved the order, he did not formally condemn it, which would have been normal in those days. One month later, Pope Clement died. Eight months later, King Philip died. Ironically, the Pope's body was burned to ashes by a fire that was caused by lightning that struck the church where he was lying in state. The King died of a stroke he suffered during a hunt. But, contrary to what our history teachers have told us, the Order of the Knights Templar did not end here. New orders were found with new names that were basically the continuation of the Knights Templar. Think Military Order of Christ in Portugal, Supreme Order of Christ in Italy, and so on and so forth. In every European country, the Knights Templar simply lived on the way they had, as if nothing much had changed. Only the order names had. The Order of the Rosicrucians appeared, founded by Christian Rosenkreutz, a German aristocrat. Was it connected to the Knights Templar? Absolutely. The sign of the equal armed cross of the Knights Templar was combined with a rose. It can be found in medieval churches across France, Spain and Portugal. Yet another secret order was founded in 1534. Two centuries, two decades, and two years after the official dissolution of the Order of the Knights Templar, the Jesuit Order. The Jesuit Order was a Catholic religious order founded in Paris. Make no mistake though, the Jesuit Order was not an order of pious monks worshipping Jesus from within the walls of their safe monasteries. It was a military order of extreme who had sworn an oath of absolute submission and obedience to the Pope and to their superior general. Let's have a look at their initiation oath. I declare that I have no opinion or will of myself, but without hesitation I will obey every command I receive from my superiors and the Pope's and Jesus Christ's militia. I promise further and declare that when the opportunity arises, I will conduct a ruthless war, secretly or publicly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am instructed to do, to exterminate and destroy them of the whole earth, and that I will not spare age, sex or class, and that I will hang up, burn, boil, cook, peel, strangle, and bury these shameful heretics, rip the stomachs and wombs of their wives, and crush the heads of their children against the wall, for the purpose to destroy their horrible race forever. If this cannot be done openly, I will secretly administer the cup with poison, the strangling rope, the steel of the dagger, or the leaden bullet regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, as I will at any time be instructed by an agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Jesuits, formation of which hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all of my moral powers, and with this dagger which I now receive, I will subscribe my name written in my own blood, 
in testimony thereof. And should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and sulfur burned therein, with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. Hmm... Not exactly what you would expect from an order of Jesus, right? Mind you, when we refer to the Jesuit order in relationship to the cabal, we are not talking about the lower segments of the order. I personally know of Jesuit priests who are wonderful human beings and who've brought a lot of beauty and wisdom into this world. What we're referring to here is the top of the pyramid, the absolute elite of the order better known as the Jesuit Council. Documents from the Golden Age show us that the Jesuit order grew into an extremely powerful group of men. Their influence went far beyond the religious world. It stretched all the way into the secular. They infiltrated the old Masonic lodges. The Masons were skilled tradesmen in the construction trade. They worked with their hands. They worked hard, physical labor. The infiltrated Jesuits were allowed to join because of their contributions in the area of architecture, science, and arts. They were called the Free and Accepted Masons, hence the name Freemasons. The Freemasons were wealthy men with a special knowledge of architecture. It is known that they were interested in the Temple of Solomon, just like the Knights Templar. Furthermore, they were focused on the preservation of esoteric knowledge, for instance, about the Kabbalah. The fascination with the Temple of Solomon is not the only link between the Freemasons and the Knights Templar. Even today, the York Rite administers three orders of masonry, one of which is the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar of the York Rite is a military branch of the Freemasons, just like the medieval order of the Knights Templar. They both have the symbol of the equal armed Red Cross. So, in short, the Freemasons were a highly secretive group of powerful Jesuits who had infiltrated the countless Masonic lodges across the world. They founded their own Umbrella Lodge in 1717, the premier Grand Lodge of England, and that would turn out to be their salvation. What happened? The Jesuits had become way too powerful to king of 80 of states, one who obviously felt threatened by the whole order. They banned the order and put pressure on the Pope, Clement XIV, to do the same. In 1773, the Pope succumbed to their demand. He promulgated the Dominus Acredemptor, the Bull of Extinction, that put an end to the Jesuit order. It seems indeed history repeated itself. But guess what? It didn't end there. Just like the Knights Templar before them, they continued using another name. In this case, the Freemasons. One year after his betrayal of the Jesuits, Pope Clement was murdered by poisoning. Just like the Luciferian Khazars, the Jesuits too, and their predecessors, like the Knights Templar, had a taste for revenge. Now we promised that our two storylines would come together at an historical event that would massively impact the world. We have finally reached that point. Do you want to know what happened? This feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it.